Democratic Vice Mayor Christina Fugazi, District 5. With Councilmember Saul Jobrak, who represents District 1. Councilmember Dan Wright, District 2. Councilmember Paul Canabert, District 3. Councilmember Susan Lenz, District 4. And Councilmember Kimberly Wormsley, who represents District 6. You know, people have been asking me, you know, about the process that we've that we've undertaken here. Uh, and what I've been telling them is that when you've had a, a police chief for 10 years, uh, which is really unusual in, in terms of big cities in America, uh, you need to do something different. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's an opportunity for the community to be reengaged and sort of to be rejuvenated in terms of its participation uh, in the process. As I said, uh, Stockton was fortunate enough to have a chief of police in Eric Jones who came up through the ranks and served as chief for nearly a decade. Uh, he's been followed by interim chief James Kraska who has been doing a fantastic job in terms of leading the department during this transition period. Uh, we're in the final stage of a process that began in January, working with a consultant experienced in nationwide recruitment of executives, including police chiefs. The consulting firm helped us to develop the profile and associated outreach materials and channels of communications for a nationwide search. This included opportunities and challenges that the new police chief would face and the professional characteristics and personal qualities uh, for the Stockton police chief position. A 45-day search process was launched at the end of January with a deadline for applications of March 14th of this year. A community survey was launched on February the 2nd with a press release, social media, Ask Stockton email list, and a link on the City of Stockton website homepage, and it was available uh, in paper format as well. A separate survey was offered to members of the Stockton Police Department to get their sentiments and their views and their ideas and their feedback. The city's consultant, in addition, interviewed nearly 40 community leaders uh, to hear what qualities and characteristics they would look for and would like to see in Stockton's next police chief. Preliminary screening of candidates was conducted via Zoom by the city's consultant, and the consultant invited the finalists uh, you see here this evening for in-person interviews. This town hall tonight, which will be followed by a meet and greet with you all uh, out in the lobby area. The in-person panel interviews took place early today, so the candidates have had a very full and busy day with panel interviews in the morning, as well as additional panel interviews uh, this afternoon. The interview panels included members of the city manager's review board, representatives of law enforcement, and city staff. This is such an important position within our community that we felt it was important for you all to have the opportunity to meet and hear from the candidates. The mayor and each council member have submitted questions to ask of the candidates in this public setting, and we will ask the questions exactly as submitted by the mayor and the individual council member. Community members were offered the opportunity to submit questions that will be asked of all candidates this evening as well. Uh, this will allow each candidate to respond to the identical questions. So again, they are still in the evaluation process. They are still being assessed. You will have the opportunity to talk with the candidates one-on-one -on -one, uh, in the lobby immediately following this session. Uh, tonight, we have Jean Acevedo, who many of you may already know or be aware of, who has graciously agreed to serve as our moderator for this evening. Mr. Acevedo is an adjunct, adjunct business professor at San Joaquin Delta College and serves as executive director at Stockton Impact Corp. He has a career in business development, government service, and business education. Uh, some of you may know him from his early days in government as a district representative for assembly members Barbara Matthews, uh, then Kathleen uh, Calgiani. Since then, he has worked 
for the Hospice of San Joaquin, leading the expansion of facilities throughout the county, and now Stockton Impact Court. So at this time, I'm going to turn everything over to our moderator, Jean. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you, Manager Black. Um, this forum wouldn't be possible without your leadership, your commitment, and service to our city. So thank you so much for coordinating this for all of us. As mentioned, I am Jean Acevedo. I, have, I am humbled to be before you to serve you as the, as the role or realm of moderator. So mayor, city council, candidates, fellow residents of Stockton. It is with a privilege that I'm here sitting to uh, post the questions for our candidates. Before we move on, I do want to ask all of you to silence your cell phones. Um, if you can put it on mute or turn it off. And if you have any needs for the facilities, they are towards the back, on the right and the left. It's uh, males on the right and females on the left. For the audience, we are here for the same reason. We share a common interest in hearing from the candidates. The next chief of police carries a, a huge weight as it is one of the most extreme and important leadership positions of our city. Uh, with their leadership, we'll be able to work with our, with our police uh, team and as a city as a whole. For the candidates, congratulations. You are definitely the finalist of uh, many individuals that, are, that will be interested and fascinated to be sitting in your spot right now. So congratulations for being here. As Manager Harry Black highlighted, the process started in January, so it's been a long journey. You're sitting here following your interest, your dedication, your commitment to public service. So thank you so much for being here. The city engaged uh, Ralph Anderson and Associates, a nationwide leader in executive recruitment to management recruitment process. The community survey was launched back in February uh, 2nd, 2022, so a couple of months ago, and members of the Stockton Police Department were provided with a separate survey. These candidates that you have before you have been interviewed by city staff, leaders in law enforcement, as well as city managers reviewing board. Today's forum continues the process. This evening, we will offer each candidate an opportunity to respond to the same questions. The questions were prepared by our city council, our manager, excuse me, not our manager, our mayor, and uh, the other, uh, other, other topics, other questions were submitted by members of the community. While some of the questions may be like those asked in the one-on-one -on -one conversation or interviews earlier today for the candidates, the candidates have not been previewed on any of these questions. In fact, I, I have them here in a sealed envelope, so I haven't even been previewed myself. So <laughs> be assured that they haven't seen them. Um, I'm sure that some of you, as well as myself, are dying to ask them, ask them a couple of questions. So there is a meet and greet hour once we exit the forum, and you'll be able to meet them at the tables outside. So candidates will be available at the lobby for the meet and greet. The meet and greet is the opportunity for you to interact, for you to post questions, and, be, and receive some specific answers to those questions. Otherwise, I'm sure that we will be here until the middle of the night. About the candidates, there is a short biography that has been available on the city's website. And paper copies were available on the tables as you were coming in, and as you were walking in, I'm sure that some of you had an opportunity to interact with the ushers who could have given you an opportunity to pick, pick up a copy. For introduction purposes, allow me to uh, mention their names and I will read just briefly a, a small synopsis of their own bio. So I will ask the audience to hold the applause for a couple of minutes while I introduce each one of them. Um, so for purposes of, of name recognition, please, candidates, raise your hand. Um, Catherine Nance, Antonio Tony Sager, Stan McFadden, 
and Joe Sullivan. So please join me in welcoming them to this uh, forum. As noted, uh, allow me to read a little bit about their bio. The bios are uh, quite in detail in your hands, so you're more than welcome to read them later on. So Deputy Chief Catherine Nance is a 25-year-old year veteran of the Stockton Police Department. She was promoted to Deputy Chief in 2020 and currently oversees the Logistics Bureau, which includes administrative services, technical services, fiscal affairs, and planning neighborhood services, and the animal shelter. Captain Tony, Antonio Tony Sager Jr. joined the police, Stockton Police Department in November 1997. His career began with assignments in community policing and as a narcotics officer. In 2007, Sager was promoted to sergeant, sergeant where he worked in the field of operations division. In 2011, he was promoted to lieutenant and served primarily as a South Strategic Operations Commander and as the initial manager of the Police Chief's Community Advisory Board. In August 2014, Sager was promoted to captain and since has commanded four of the five divisions within the Stockton Police Department. Deputy Chief of Police Stan McFadden has been in law enforcement for nearly three decades with the San Jose Police Department. He currently manages the department's largest bureau, the Bureau of Field Operations, leading to the Field Training Officer Program, Merge, SWAT, Tactical Negotiations Unit, Metro Unit, Street Crimes Unit, Violent Crimes Enforcement Team, K-9 Unit, Bomb Unit, Traffic Enforcement, Airport Division, Airport Unit, Crime Prevention Unit, School Liaison, Community Service Officers, the Mobile Crisis ass Assessment Team, and Psychiatric Emergency Response Team. And former Deputy Commissioner Joe Sullivan. He's a veteran of more than 30 years with the Philadelphia Police Department. He held the rank of Deputy Commissioner and commanded a force of 4,698 sworn and professional staff. His responsibilities included leading to the ComStat process, the strategic implementation of the department's data-driven and intelligence-based pinpoints and violent crime reduction, anti-gun strategies, overseas community relations, serving as the department's liaison to the Anti-Defamation League, the Jewish Federation, the LGBTQ community, and the Resilience Project, a mayor's task force assembled to respond to the opioid crisis. So please join me in welcoming them once again as you guys. So let's start with the candidates on my, on my left. And we're going to be moving towards the right, offering each candidate the opportunity to respond to the same questions. Candidates will have two minutes to respond to each of the questions. And for purposes of fairness, we have a timekeeper. So um, I will be interrupting you if you're exceeding. So I would encourage you to keep an eye out on the timekeeper. So let's get started. And the first question reads, this is a question that was posted by Mayor Kevin Lincoln. The background to the question that he posted was, Stockton has recently had a surge of violence contributing to the ongoing trauma experienced by the city. And the question is, what do you see as your role in addressing this issue in the community and in the department? And how do you see that leading to the retention and increased job satisfaction for members of the departments. Ms. Lanza? Thank you. 
Um, I see that, I'm a little shaky, there we go. Uh, the first one to talk, I guess we have to adjust the microphone a little bit. Um, I see that my role in leading the department through the crime and the violence that we're seeing, we've had a very tragic weekend with three homicides and then the death of a 15 year old at a school. And I see the chief's position, my position, as being one of a leader to ensure that we are on our path of crime prevention and continuing the path that has been built um, along the way. We have a very successful, successful operation ceasefire model that we can continue to follow but expand upon. The community involvement needs to happen at the forefront. It needs to happen in the intervention phase and in the prevention phase before we have to get to that enforcement set. We have a good community engagement groups. We have a lot of opportunities to engage with the community and ensure that they are a part of our reduction strategies. Reaching out to the communities and asking, how do we need to police your community? What do you need to see from our officers? All of these things will lead to um, increased retention and increased morale. Right now, the officers are very overstressed and very overworked for the crimes that they're having to deal with on a daily basis. It's up to the leader, to the chief, for me to say, how can we better help you police our communities? What tools do you need? What tools can I provide you? And what data do you need to be more successful day in and day out? It is a very, very active role of being a police chief here in Stockton. It is nonstop, and it is one of the things that we will have to continue to work on daily in partnership with our community. It is not something that we can do alone. So my goal here is to continue the Operation Ceasefire model that we have, expand upon it, engage in our community further, and continue that we're using all of our data-driven resources that we have to ensure that we're enforcing in the correct neighborhoods and with the correct people every single day. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sager? Thank you. As a chief of police, the role, especially in the time of spike and violence, is to be the face of the department and the community that it serves. Getting out in front, speaking to what the cause is, working in our ceasefire model with our staff, and importantly, working with the community, our community groups, the families of those who have been victimized, working with the Office of Violence Prevention, being that lead for the community. In a community policing model, the police department is the community and the community is the police. So leading not only my department, but the community towards prevention and intervention, and in the case of someone who's been killed, apprehension of the suspect and bringing justice to the victim. When a community backs its police department, supports it wholly, and understands why we have to do, that will increase morale for their officers. When officers know that when they're going to the call and they're providing as much service as they can and they wish they can give more, but this is all they have, and a community comes back and says, yes, we understand. We know you're doing everything you can and thank you for what you do. A simple wave, a simple thank you, goes a long way to impact that morale, but how do I model the way as the leader? As myself, I make sure that I'm keeping myself well. I'm making sure I'm checking in and, and not allowing the everyday life to weigh me down to where I'm dragging my, the morale down myself. It's looking in the mirror and knowing that I'm taking care of my mind, body, and spirit using the, the, sorry, using the resources of our wellness network, of our peer support, our chaplaincy, everything provided through your human resources with our medical benefits, finding every avenue and being open and honest with my staff that I'm doing this, I'm modeling the way, you can do it as well. There's no stigma against taking care of yourself. You have to if you're gonna make it 30 years in this career. Thank you. Um, Mr. McFadden. Yes, it starts with the internal procedural justice, meaning you have to have the buy-in of the rank of file before any crime fighting efforts can take place on the street. And, and you do that a couple ways. Is first you I identify the mission, the goals, and the objectives. And, and then you expand that out to the community. When you're communing with the community, again, you have to be procedural just. First, you have to gain the trust of these communities. You have to let them know that you're there to help. You know, we're there to engage. Enforcement is the last resort. It starts with prevention. You know, we have to connect with our youth younger. If, we, if we're realizing it's not working at 12, you know, we have to go down to six even earlier, you know, to where we can connect with them, inspire them, lead them on the right path. When we get to the prevention efforts, it, it goes very far because it now leads them to know there's other issues, there's other things that could be done. 
You could truly reduce crime by getting that neighborhood to thrive. If you look at the neighborhoods that have the crime, it's the neighborhoods that are not thriving. That's where we have to collaborate. We have to bring everyone to the table, and it's a team policing model where it's not just uniforms. You have the uniforms, you have the social workers, you have the, you get the mental health people. You bring a team to the area as resources, and then that's where you can work on, on reducing crime. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Let, let, let me call you a little bit, Mr. Sullivan. Can you hear Mr. Sullivan? No, let me pause you for a minute. Is that better? Yes. Uh, te technical support is coming. But I, I don't think they can hear you. <laughs> While we wait, may I have a Kleenex? My nose is really running, so that's my personal technical difficulty here, you know? <laughs> but, oh, perfect, thank you. Thank you, I'll, I'll trust it. <laughs> I will, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, suddenly just got watery. How about now? There you go. Well, you know, when it comes to addressing violent crime, when it comes to building trust within the community, when it comes to retaining your officers and making them want to stay within the department and serve the community, the role of the chief is to be a leader, to be a, a team builder, and a communicator and a collaborator. Addressing violent crime, the, the police are uh, obviously a big part of the solution, but we're not the only solution. We're only going to be successful if we're working collaboratively with, with the community, working with violence interventionists, uh, some of the many programs that you have here already, community-based violence intervention, hospital-based violence intervention. Um, but the, the important thing is to drive that down to the line level of the officers so that uh, it, community policing is not a spe should not be a specialty part of policing. It should be something that's embraced by every single member of the department. Sworn members, professional staff, everybody understands. You can have all the great community policing programs in the world, but if, office, if citizens are not respected in their everyday encounters with their police officers, there cannot be trust. And without trust, there is not cooperation. And without cooperation, I will not be successful in driving down crime. And that's why my top two priorities are crime, but simultaneously crime and, and building relationships and trust within community policing in a trauma-informed approach, understanding that violence impacts communities. And all too often, it's focused on, on communities that are poor and communities of color. And it especially impacts the children living in those communities. It impacts their scholastic achievement. Um, so doing those things, professionalizing the department, getting officers involved, making them feel part of the team will enable us to be successful in addressing the crime while also making officers proud to be part of the Stockton Police Department and want to continue to be members of the Stockton Police Department and serve the people of Stockton. Thank you. 
already. Second question. This question comes from um, Vice Mayor Christina Fugasi, and she asked, describe your leadership style within the police ranks and in public with residents. And it's a two-part question, she added. Are they the same or different, and why? Can you again? Please. Yes, thank you. Um, I would say my leadership style is the same both personally and in public and also with my uh, staff. And uh, from the line level officer to my command staff and my management team, I definitely lead by example. I am very hardworking and dedicated to this organization, and I'm very clear in my expectations. I will expect uh, excellence for my employees. I expect policies to be followed, and I expect the uh, goals that we have in the department to be met by all employees. I believe in being very clear in what I expect from everybody around me, and including the community. It's a mutual path, though, with the community in the sense that I can expect that we're going to both come to the table, that we're going to speak freely and openly, and we're going to have courageous and hard conversations that might hurt my, my feelings a little bit, and it might hurt their feelings a little bit. But open and honest, ongoing communication is both how I lead and both how I treat my personal life, and it will be exactly how I treat the community. I feel that we need to ensure that everybody has their voices heard uh, throughout the department and the organization, and that they understand that they're my priority. They need to maintain their own sanity and their own safety to make sure that they're doing everything they can to give back to our community. That every day they come to work willing to give 100%, and that they're willing to show up as the community needs them to show up every single day. And that's the same ex expectations that I have for the community, that we need to show up together, have an honest conversation, and be one in how we're going to solve our problems. I can't solve all the world's problems. It it's not even feasible. But I can use my staff, the people that have been here the longest, and the people that have the experience, and the brand new people that are seeing things with a brand new eye. And I can use my community members that see things from a completely different angle than we do. Thank you. Thank you. My leadership style is one of being a servant leader. I am there to support all the staff, professional sworn of the Stockton Police Department, as well as the community, the community groups and relationships that we have. My leadership style is built off of respect. I understand and after years of being a supervisor and a manager and a parent, I'm not always going to be liked. But respect goes a long way. Respect continues relationships even when someone doesn't like you. With respect, I set my expectations, and I expect my people to be professional, to give me 100% of who they are that day, to be professional in the fact that they know how to do their job, be professional in the fact that they're doing it in a way that is equitable to the community. I expect hard work and hustle. And then I tell my staff, what I expect out of you is what you can expect out of me. We can accept that from each other. Having those type of relationships with my department members, with the community, where we could have open and honest conversations built on respect and trust will be how I lead this department and this community. Thank you. Mr. McFadden. Yes, I like to see myself as a 21st century a leader, which I think encompasses a lot of things. I'll start with being transformative. I'm always thinking out of the box, and I'm always seeing how we can be better as an agency and how we can deliver a better service to our community. When we do that, we, we discuss those internally and externally. I, I also speak on how important it is to care. You know, when, when we care about our employees, they'll work hard for us. And when I say care, it, it, it means you give them a voice, you have conversations. I have a very large bureau, but I still have set platforms up to where all rank and file in my bureau can have conversations with me. I lead them, I guide them, I develop them. They're more than a badge number to me. Whether they're professional staff or they're sworn, I care about them. They're a daughter, they're a father, they're a mother, they're a, fa you know, they're a grandfather. I, I care about my people. With my community, I'm a team builder. I'm a collaborator. I'm a friend. 
I, I wear multiple hats. I'm responsive, I'm accessible. I, I model the behavior that I want to see from my officers. That's how I'm able to get the buy-in from my rank and file, because they know I care about them, and they know I lead from the front. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. The, Sullivan. The description that, that I most value is uh, lead from the front, lead by example, and be a collaborator. That's a collaborator internally within my department with officers of all ranks, including my, and also along with my professional staff, understanding the very important contribution that they make. But lead from the front is extremely important. My officers, my community, they need to see me out there out, at crime scenes, at special events, at community engagement opportunities. They need to see me, they be able, need to be, have the opportunity to be, for me to be accessible to them, to be listening to what they had to say, listening to their suggestions, and that goes right back to collaboration. You know, when I led CompStat for the Philadelphia Police Department, um, we, we unfortunately did not have an adequate facility. It was very cramped. All the commanders were in front of me and the officers and sergeants were behind me, as well as community members um, and people from various law enforcement agencies. And I always made sure to take my chair and turn it around at some point and solicit feedback, fact, feedback from behind me. And it was often the best feedback I got in that session. And it was really appreciated. And I'll say the same thing with the community. When, when, I, when I led the DNC operation in Philadelphia, it was a rousing success, something that I'm extremely proud of. And, but the only reason that it was successful is the way that I collaborated with the community. And, and in this instance, the protest community. I spent months working with, with the protest community, getting their input, working with the ACLU, I'm working with different protest groups, and of course, working internally. So they're, they're the three things that I would like, uh, I think that best represents my leadership style, both um, externally and internally. Thank you. The next question. Uh, the next question comes from the community. Um, so given the state of policing across the county in public perception of policing, why are you interested in the position of Stockton Police Chief? Thank you. Uh, I am a lifelong Stockton resident. I was born and raised here. Uh, my husband and I still live here. I raised four children in this town, and I love it wholeheartedly. Uh, my parents live here. His parents live here. So we are uh, true Stocktonians, and I will, don't want to ever change that. I'm very happy in this community. Uh, when I started my career, I had no idea that I would uh, ever be sitting here being interviewed to be police chief. It's still a little... Uh, daunting and, and different for me. It wasn't what I thought I would uh, aspire to be. But as I gained more leadership roles through this department, I realized that that was my calling, was to be open and upfront and honest with my staff and with the people that work for me, develop and mentor them, and make sure that I have a police department that's ready to serve our community every single day. As I grew further in this department, I realized how important it is for the community involvement and engagement and how we're dependent on our success based on the outside surroundings. I learned how to develop those partnerships and I continue to work on those partnerships every day. I love this community and this department and I truly feel that at this point in time, I am a trusted leader in our organization. I'm a trusted leader in our community. I am well respected and it is uh, definitely my calling to lead this department further and to continue the good hard work that we have done but expand on that. Take the data driven policing that we're already doing and make it bigger. Take our outreach workers and make it bigger. Do more and more for this community until there's no stopping us and we're better than we ever have been. My department needs trust right now. They need leadership and they need mentorship that they are aware of and they know. They're very, very nervous about everything going on in society with uh, transferring and leaving. And the biggest thing I can do for this department is to provide the stability that they need. And that is my goal. And I have absolutely no doubt in my abilities to be the chief of this department. Mr. Sager? Why I want to be the chief of police. It's one of those questions you hear sometimes when you're like in the first grade. I was asked that question said when I was 17, after I told then Chief Eric Chavez, I'm sorry, Ed Chavez, that one day I'd have his job. 17, getting ready to graduate from Edison High School, and probably arrogant as can be. And he laughed and smiled at me, and he reminded me of that when I got hired four years later. You still want my job. 
Yes, I do, sir. Didn't know at that time why. I thought that was the pinnacle of a career that when you're the chief, that's the pinnacle. After 24 years with the department, I realized it's not a pinnacle. It's just the next level. It's a door to go through. and It's an opportunity to provide leadership to the department that I grew up in. I've been a police officer with the Stockton Police Department more than half my life. Much like, sorry, I was raised here. I tell people I was born in Stockton. They tell me, no, you were born in French camp. There's a difference. Well, those of us in South Stockton, that's French camp is Stockton. <laughs> I went through SUSD schools. I was part of SUSD's Gift and Talent program. We graduated from Edison High School. I'm a proud soul. I never left more than four blocks from Edison. Went to Fresno and came back to the community that offered me the job and stood here because of the people that I worked with, people that I want to lead because they respect me and I respect them, a community that I want to lead for because I come from them and I see them every day. While I still live in Stockton, while I worship here in Stockton, my children go to here in Stockton. My parents live here in Stockton. I want to be Stockton's chief because to me, that's being the leader of this community. Thank you. Mr. McFadden. Yes, I want to be the chief of Stockton for a, a, a number of reasons. You know, I'll, I'll start with, you know, I'm connected to Stockton. You know, for almost 15 years now, I have coached athletes from Stockton. You know, it's been young girls from ages 10 and under up through 18 that have made their way to college where I've worked with them, I inspired them, I, I, I mentored them. You know, that's why you know, the incident with Alicia hit me hard because she was a softball player and I know how passionate those softball players are. I know how they utilize softball as their vehicle to get where they want to be. And um, I, I met my wife in Stockton, you know, and, and we're married. You know, my, my primary care physician is in Stockton. So I have, I, I have strong connections to Stockton. And, what I want to bring is, is hope. You know, information has came to me where, you know, morale is low in the department, and I am a team builder. I am a morale builder. You know, I know the union reached out to my unit and my current agency, and, and they gave them nothing but positive recommendations. I care about people. When you care about people, you know, they work hard for you. You know, I've had the opportunity over the last month to meet a lot of great people, a lot of passionate people here in Stockton. Stocktonians and Stocktonian allies. And there's a lot of passion here. There's people that are willing to do the heavy lifting with me. As chief, I, I want to build off those relationships that already exist, and I, and I want to bridge the new relationships that I know are out there. You know, the people are here. The people want it. There's incredible officers in the department. You know, I want to focus on organizational wellness so I can make sure the officers are well. If the officers don't feel well, they can't perform well in the field. So that's one of my primary functions as chief of police is to make sure your officers that don your uniforms are feeling good about themselves and, and they're feeling good about the mission. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. The Philadelphia Police Department afforded me the opportunity to have a career that very few men or women will, will ever be able to replicate. I was able to travel to Rome to prepare to protect the Pope. As I said, I oversaw a DNC. I, I, I oversaw an Eagles parade, a uh, Super Bowl parade, uh, which was too late in coming. Um, I've resolved hundreds of tactical situations successfully and peacefully, and I've been able to work within communities to build relationships as well as fight crime. But the one professional goal that I have not achieved is to be a police chief. And th that is something that um, when, when you're doing that search, you need to find an opportunity that match your skill set. And I think that the skills that I learned in Philadelphia, which is a very diverse city, a very complicated city, um, basically if you can be a police officer there and a, or, and a police commissioner there, you're qualified to do it anywhere. And I really believe that I represent a good fit for Stock, Stockton and the challenges that are currently facing Stockton. I also have great respect for the work that's already been done uh, by the, the, the police department in Stockton, which makes it even more attractive to me. Now, I have a passion for, for policing, and wherever I'm a policeman, I'm going to do, do that with every fiber of my being. I don't like to sleep. Um, I consider being a police chief a calling, a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour calling, where you spend your evenings where, at community meetings, you spend your weekends engaging with the community and, and, and going to churches and other places of worship and getting the perspective of, of the community, listening and putting those things into action. I love leading brave men and women. And 
which will represent the majority of the Stockton Police Department. And therefore, I see this as an a, a excellent opportunity for me. I'd be fortunate if I was granted that opportunity, and, uh, and I hope that I will be. Thank you. The next question comes from Council Member Sol Jobrak. How do you plan to work with your staff to recognize and address their needs as well as the community needs? So initially, working with the staff for me involves finding out where their, need, where their needs are. Um, I feel that I have a pretty good pulse on what is going on in my organization right now, but sometimes you never know, and it, change happens. It is, we evolve and uh, progress through this organization. I will definitely uh, plan on meeting with the staff more frequently, being present, and making sure that they know that their chief is, cares about them and wants their well-being to be at the forefront of of everybody's priorities. Uh, I believe in surveys. I believe in one-on-one -on -one meetings. I believe on group meetings and having open and honest dialogue. Um, I also keep a, a lot of close tabs on what is going on throughout the organization. I currently do this with people that are in patrol, check in frequently, people that are in investigations, check in frequently to get a pulse on what we're doing. We have a very robust wellness network. We have a very robust chaplaincy program and making sure that the staff is aware that these, that these items exist for them and that there's no harm in using them. Um, I'm very honest about my self-care, what I do to ensure that I am productive every day, that I reduce my stress level, uh, taking care of myself and my well-being, and I will pass all of that information along to my staff so that they know that it's so important for them also. When your staff shows up every day ready and willing to work and uh, wanting to get out there, they're going to serve the community much better than they are. Uh, I think one of the issues that m with morale that we've had in the department is we have somewhat siloed our community engagement and involvement to a smaller group of people, smaller group of sworn officers, and one of my goals is to delete that silo immediately and spread that community engagement out throughout the entire organization. To, sh to ensure that all of my officers, all of my professional staff have the opportunity to meet with the community members and see that they are welcomed, that they are liked, and they are needed in this community. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Sager. Sorry, could you please repeat the question? Absolutely. Again, from Council Member Sol Joel Brack, uh, how do you plan to work with your staff to recognize and address their needs as well as the community needs? And both working with our staff and the community, it has to be collaborative. It has to be open and honest and we have to provide both with the voice. With our staff, as part of my first 60 days, I'll be, and the time leading up to day zero, will be full, for, full rush forward in meeting with employee associations, with my management team, with the rest of the executive team, with uh, our professional staff, and a number of people in our community, including the, the members of the community advisory board, as many members through the city manager of the CMRB, with our established relationships with different community members and community groups, and to get that pulse on not only what is going on in the department, what's going on in the community. Within the department, within those first 60 days, we'll be instituting a survey, a 360 survey, with some very simple questions of what do you think we're doing well? What do you think we could do better of? Do you think morale is, then providing someone with the opportunity to say if morale, they feel morale is high or low, and why? And in the community, how are we doing at our job? What can we do better? How can we, who else can we partner with? And with that information, taking that data and breaking it down to strategically have those conversations and find where we have our, our gaps in our relationships within the department and outside of the department. As well with the, uh, addressing the, the first 60 days is being there for a number of meetings that maybe will take away from my personal life but are necessary so that the relationships can be built upon trust, that people can see me and know that I'm the chief of police, but not only that, that I bring my staff with me, my command staff, all the way down to the officer because I was part of those community policings in the late 90s and early 2000s where our officers and sergeants went to meeting. They were the face of the department, and if we allow that and we do that again, then we will have a true succession plan where we can have officers for the next 30 to 50 years who support their community and are trusted by them. Yes, thank you, too. Already, um, Mr. McFadden, 
Yes, I think this is where my trauma-informed leadership really comes into play, is we have several platforms at San Jose where we see them as outlets for our officers, where they have the chaplaincy program. I have a full-time crisis management unit, which is rare among most departments, where these are dedicated sergeants, officers, that have a background in mental health. And they're there as an outlet for our officers that may be in crisis, they're, they're on call 24-7, and they work very close with our chaplaincy program. In addition to that, we have peer support that supports our crisis management unit. And again, there are additional outlets. It's something I started are called focus groups, where our crisis management unit will get the temperature of the department and have a creative platform to where they can have conversations, whatever the topic may be. It, it could be supervision, it, it could be leadership. Whatever is concerning to our people, we open that conversation to them to, to where it has no executive staff there, no command staff. It, it just has officers and their sergeants having this honest conversations and focusing on, on, on the wellness of the officers. But again, it, it comes back to caring about your people, it, it inspiring them to be healthy and to have that good work-life balance. With the community, it, it bleeds over. Something I have my rank and file do is we do walk and talks in our neighborhoods uh, throughout San Jose is very important because once I get the officers out of the cars, they realize just how supportive the community are, how, how bad the community wants them there, how the community wants to work and, and help toe the line. So um, you know, the more we get the officers out of their call, cars and they're hearing about the incredible support they have and they're seeing the smiles and, and interacting with the children, it, it's refreshing to them and it reminds them why they became an officer. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan? If I am fortunate enough to, to achieve uh, my goal uh, to be named as the Chief of Stockton, I, I can assure you that I'll be consciously aware, very consciously aware, that that's going to have a potential impact on the rest of the department. And I will move very cautiously and with great respect, beginning with the executive staff and trickling down through all of the ranks to make sure that I assure everyone that I am respectful and, and very grateful for the great work that they are doing and have done and how much I will be leaning on them and how much I will value their input. Yeah, uh, we'll be, I'll be meeting with my executive staff every, every morning, begin our day and talk about the last 24 hour operational period, what's occurred and what we intend to accomplish in the next 24 hour period. I'll be doing that at all ranks and, and, and if certainly including uh, my civilian leaders and, and, and workers and I'll be visiting every facility but when I go to community meetings, I'm going to also be very cautious, to, I mean, very, very deliberate in ensuring that the police officers that patrol that particular area and their supervisors attend the meetings with me, as well as the detectives that have investigative responsibility in that area, because I want to make sure that the message of community policing, that that, that message is sent to each and every member of the department, that it is everyone's responsibility. It is not a specialist responsibility. And just in, in very informal meetings with officers, I will, I will be holding roundtable discussions where I am the only supervisor present or the only uh, ranking supervisor present at, 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 at every level within the department. There's one thing I've learned. If you, if you ask people for their opinion, and once they know they can trust you, boy, will they give it to you and you will get some great advice you will really learn what, what, what are the, the weak points, the strong points, what needs to be done, what your priorities should be. And of course, we'll be doing the same thing as I discussed earlier with the community. Thank you. The next question comes from the community. What do you see as the role of police departments in developing solutions and strategies to address or respond to the impacts of current social challenges, such as homelessness, drug addiction, mental health, and individuals with intellectual or developmental disabilities. The role of the police department in the social issues that you described is as a collaborative response to our community partners. There is a need for uh, police to be uh, involved and aware and respond to crimes and specific crimes and threats of violence and anything that could cause danger to our community members. But there's a space there for our community members to resolve problems without police intervention and to do it in a manner that is still 
uh, effective and deliberate and ensures that the community members that are in crisis or have these needs have their needs met. Uh, the police departments, uh, we can't provide the services that a lot of these issues need. But we can be there to ensure the safety of the people that are involved in these crises. Uh, one of the programs that I work on is LEAD, uh, the Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion. It is a mental health program that the patrol officers in the downtown area work with mental health, with different service providers, to get people that are experiencing issues right now, homelessness, mental health issues, drug addiction, to get them help. It's one of the programs that I really, really enjoyed when I was a little more hands-on supervising of it because you saw, the, you saw the profits of it, the people that came out of that program. People got jobs, they had homes, and it was very valued. It's a small program currently because we don't have the resources both with behavioral health and with the police department to expand it, but those are the types of collaborations that we need to maintain and continue. Uh, each one of these things that you described has a nexus to law enforcement and to public safety that we have to make sure that we're there for and that we're keeping all of our community safe, including the people that are in crisis. But it is the greatest opportunity we have to collaborate with other groups and to find help and get other people to respond and help people that are in yes. need. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sager. Police departments across America are the face of the government response to emergency. Whether that emergency be a crime, or that emergency be a, an issue of mental health or substance abuse, or a person sleeping on the sidewalk. The police department is commonly the first place they call. As the police department, as the, as the chief of police with the Stockton Police Department, our role is to, to call that data and then sit at the collaborative table of service providers, as well as other public safety agencies on helping people at a human level. I, like I said, I grew up in Stockton, so I've seen the homeless issue grow over the years when it was once confined to certain areas. My first job, uh, my first real job was working for what's now Behavioral Health Services as a student in prevention, learning about uh, drug, uh, drug diversion, teaching kids how not to use drugs. So I know that there are plenty of services out there but the police department, we're the ones who get the call first. We know where to go. And that is one of the biggest, that is one of the biggest responsibilities we can bring to the table. We can tell where the community is calling. We can tell where we're responding to. But in addition, one thing I've learned is being collaborative in a number of projects in my career, working with non-governmental organizations, other governmental organizations, is that when we all get in the room, for some reason, everybody always turns and looks at the person in uniform to lead. That doesn't mean that I have to have the entire responsibility or my staff has that entire responsibility, but naturally law enforcement is looked upon to lead groups, so to provide that guidance to the overall collaborative group, okay, who has what, who's bringing what to the stone soup, and how can we make it work? Thank you. Mr. McFadden. Yes, in San Jose, we current. Test it again? Test, test. Okay, good. All right, so in San Jose, we have roughly 6,000 um, homeless individuals there. So we have to be creative and, and, and collaborate with our, our community stakeholders. Uh, something I believe I could bring to Stockton is just a knowledge of the resources that are out there. You know, for example, there's several 911 calls where the 911 system is used for folks that aren't committing a crime, but they're in crisis. And I can remember one caller where um, I ended up at the scene years ago, and they say, you know, for God's sakes, I called the suicide hotline for help, and then they called the cops on me. It's like, you know, I'm not calling that hotline anymore. You know, so I think we're at a, a, a stage in policing where we have to be smarter. And what I mean by being smarter is there's other resources out there that can help us. In, in San Jose, we run two models, a dual model, which I think would be very effective in, in Stockton, is that we have a PERT model, right? That's a psychiatric emergency response team, right? So people experiencing psychosis, extreme uh, behavioral issues. We're, we're there, but we're not the front. You know, we have these clinicians at the front taking the lead on these courses. You know, we also have a mobile crisis assessment team that is our unit that collaborates with clinicians as well. We bring clinicians out to our hostage bear cases. Some of the, I mean, these are major events where historically officers would be the ones on, uh, on the on the bullhorn giving instructions, 
but now we have clinicians doing that because that's their, that's their skill set. You know, that's not a skill set for police officers. So we continue to do that, and with the addiction and, and substance abuse, we have to have street level units. We have to be that initial responder. That's never going to change, but quickly we have to get the folks to the right people. And that's where we take a team police model where we have other folks with us when we make contact, and we have addiction specialists, we have other aides, we have substance abuse experts, and then we can work to collaborate to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Sullivan. Yes, in Philadelphia, I oversaw, alongside my, my, my social services partners, the creation of the drug diversion program. I also work to support drug courts uh, as well as mental health courts. Um, but the, the, the important thing, I also uh, what, what was responsible for the creation of a team of officers that dealt with uh, 700 drug dependent individuals in, that live within a very small area with, within Philadelphia and the entire population is, are addicted to fentanyl or uh, some form of opioids and uh, as well as a separate team that works in Center City with a, a much different cohort of homeless individuals. So I know the value of working cooperatively. I also know the value of police stepping back and understanding that we do not have to be the first, first line of response. Uh, we are often not the, the best and the most qualified people to be dealing with people with special needs. Um, and that would include autistic citizens. We just had an unfortunate si um, situation in Philadelphia where uh, we had an autistic citizen have it, uh, become upset and uh, you know, people around were not properly trained to deal with that. So I understand the importance of it. Um, we cannot be successful without working with our partners. But the bottom line is the police will always be, will often always be the, the, the first um, government agency to come in contact with someone with, with, in one of those categories that has a crisis. So it's important that we are trained to, do, to handle those situations effectively. And that includes calling for our partners as quickly as possible to turn that over to them. But it begins with that call to 911, making sure we are using a criteria-based dispatching system to make sure that we are evaluating that call and we are sending the appropriate response mode with, with, the, with the right level of response and those that are best um, positioned to handle that problem. So it That's requires complete collaboration. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I hate to interrupt you as you're speaking, but I'm trying to be fair on time. Um, the next question comes from council member Dan Wright, and he offers the following background to the question. Together with police departments of Birmingham, Alabama, Fort Worth, Texas, Gary, Indiana, Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the Stockton Police Department was a voluntary participant in the de de Department of Justice National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice. And the question reads as follows. Please, tell us what you know of the initiative, focusing primarily on the issues of police community trust and building common understanding of social justice for the Stockton community. Thank you. So I was uh, very involved in that initiative when it started. I was actually the police association president at the time. And when we volunteered to be a part of this organization and to start this pathway that has, was turned out to be extremely beneficial for everybody involved, um, I had a lot of resistance with my organization. I'm sorry, I'm not sure why I'm all scratchy, but um, I had a lot of resistance within my organization and they didn't really want to participate. They were having uh, concerns with this type of uh, involvement and participation. And I was very, are we coming up to fix this yes. or is it? Let me pause you for a minute. Um, someone from technical. <laughs>
Do you want her to test it? Oh. I'm assuming that this is mid-intervention, intermission. So if anybody needs to go to the facilities, they're to the right and to the left. This is the moment. <laughs> Alrighty, so we're, we're gonna, would you like me to repost the question or? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are we good? I think we're good now, yes. Good. Thank you. Yes, I, I, uh, for purposes of fairness, allow me to restate the question in, please, if, if you don't mind. Um, please tell us, what do you know of the initiative focusing primarily on the issues of police community trust and building a common understanding of social justice for the Stockton community? Yes, thank you. So I was very involved in this initiative when it started. I was the president of the police association and it was met with some resistance by my membership at the time to engage in this type of uh, this type of uh, very large project with outside research firms. So from the very beginning, uh, one of my roles was to create trust within the organization and with the membership to participate and to fully participate. And at that time, that's when we began the procedural justice training and using our community members as being involved in that. I attended some of the very first trainings that we had with community members coming in and sharing their stories and watching my officers share their stories and building the trust between the two and seeing where the biases were and where the implicit biases were and where everybody felt their own concerns. And I think that one of the biggest outcomes of this and one of my goals is to continue this in as many ways that I can to continue these conversations with our community members and my officers is those courageous conversations and the hard conversations that came out of these meetings. The idea of cynicism, the idea of everybody has biases, and really that concept of when an officer stops somebody, do they have an implicit bias? What's going through their mind? Is it based on their safety? Is it based on their needs? And then what's going through the mind of the community members and how can they react better to one another when they engage in those conversations? It's about trust, it's about loyalty, and it's about understanding the concepts. But understanding the concepts isn't enough. We have to apply those concepts on a continual basis. Continuing on with these officers, they, um, the officers of the Stockton Police Department have a phenomenal foundation right now of understanding procedural justice and police legitimacy and community involvement. And now it's time to expand and build on the tenets that we learned during the study and how can we make this more applicable for today and what are the needs of our communities at any given moment and how can we continue to work with these concepts that we so developed early on. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sager. Thank you. I was fortunate at the time we volunteered to be part of the national initiative to be the captain over technical service division, which deals with a lot of our data, our calls for service, uh, everything that goes in our reports, anything that we collect, and our traffic stops specifically. And leading up to our, our work in the community, our work with the national initiative, I provided a lot of data to, to, the, to the national initiative and to their people and spent the entire time we were involved with that 
providing context to that data. Why, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this call for service type mean? What does uh, this type of call disposition mean? And it provided me an insight as we, as we built this data set to what was, could be perceived as going on in the community where you know, we, we do collect information on our traffic stops and we, we know that we've seen across America and almost every police department where you see a disparity between the makeup of the community and the makeup of people who are being stopped. Working with the, the National Initiative for the, uh, in the background that entire time, I got to see how our data formed up, but then also having just left special operations where we're, we did a much of our community outreach, I still had that, that touch into that community, still understanding what was going with our community advisory board just to hear what was happening uh, when the groups were going out and doing walks, when they're doing surveys, understanding that our officers did not want to do this as well because they were, they're afraid of being called biased. But doing this work taught us that we have biases. All of us do. We, we train that now. We bring in the community to train that. And I do believe coming off of the work that we've done, data-led for the NI and other projects, that we can expand that and continue to have those courageous conversations because you just can't have a hard conversation once. It just doesn't end, especially if people feel that systemically they've been uh, marginalized forever. We have to keep that door open until the communication and trust is there and then we could build off of that. Thank you. Mr. McFadden. Yes, I'm aware that Stockton, you know, they did an incredible job as far as being one of six pilot programs when, when they first lost the procedural justice, you know, the trust and legitimacy. And um, in San Jose, we also stayed progressive in that area where, you know, we trained every officer in, in procedural justice, you know. We trained them in fair and impartial policing what we started at our agency, which I would think would be very good and well received out here, is that we initiated a course called the History of Policing. And that course, it's a college course that we send all of our recruits to and talk about the awful things that have happened over the years. Why certain communities may feel a certain way about how we do business. And we found what that did is it armed our officers with the knowledge and the understanding and the patients to understand and own that, even though you know, they weren't part of it, but still have to own that and be mindful of that in the communities. Also in our training, we brought in, in stakeholders from the community right, to give their perspectives, you know, to, to speak of their trauma that have stuck with them you know, for over the years or been passed down for generations. You know, we did some detention stop um, analytics, right, to where we, we realized there were some disparities, right, to where we need to be better. And I think that's across the board throughout law enforcement is we have to do a better job at, at, at doing a fair and impartial policing and not um, over police any one neighborhood, but, but be there not for enforcement, but for engagement. And what that does is it empowers the community when we're there to say hellos, we're there to have conversations, we're, we're owning our wrongs, it's that we're moving forward in a, with humility, you know, I, I think that helps us all, not only in, in Stockton will it help us, but I think nationally uh, it'll help us in policing. Thank you. And Mr. Sullivan. Yeah, I'm certainly aware of the, the program and the importance of it and the success of it. I did have a little crash course yesterday while I was packing my suitcase. Uh, Mr. Hans Manios is the, the former head of the Police Oversight Board in, in Philadelphia, and, and we remain friends, and he's actually part of this program right now. And we were talking about the importance of procedural justice training, implicit bias training, and how that not only does it change attitudes, but it, change, it changes behaviors on the street. And we know that to be evidence-based, and that's why it's so critically important. But also making, um, as, as my colleague and, and talked about, the importance of, with, especially with new officers in the academy, making sure they understand the history of policing in America and, and in the world. The history of policing here in America and its relationship uh, to slavery and, and enforcing slave laws even after um, a, a supposed emancipation occurred. But also the, the role of policing in, in the Holocaust. And uh, I was fortunate enough to work under Charles Ramsey, who I consider to be one of the most brilliant uh, law enforcement officers that I've ever met. And one of the things that he directed me to do as the chief of training, I took the first class of police recruits to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And to be quite honest, I was skeptical in the beginning. And at the end, 
when we had our, our, our debrief. I mean, everyone was, was a little choked up and emotional. And uh, we, we've expanded that program in Philadelphia now, where we go to the Constitution Center and the African American Museum for those very same reasons. Um, so in, in, ter in terms of that, and also the importance of having the community involved in the development of policies that affect them, um, such as here, the community was involved in the development of policy for, to, to uh, uh, direct uh, uh, unmanned aerial vehicles. I think that's crucially important, and I did the same thing with the LGBTQ community in Philadelphia. Thank you. The next question comes from Council Member Paul Canaba. Looking at the tragic events that happened at Stack High School recently, what would you do as police chief to work with Stockton Unified School District, SUSD, police department, to prevent such an occurrence in the future? Thank you. That uh, event, I think, rocked our whole community in a way that we haven't seen in a really long time. It was such a tragedy. Uh, as police chief, my goal would be to be present to be there when it happened, to be there for the community, and to be there for Stockton Unified School District Police. We work um, in conjunction with them frequently, hand in hand, and whatever needs they had, we would meet. Uh, we did uh, work on that investigation for them. We helped out knowing that that was such a critical investigation that needed to be resolved, that we could provide any assistance that we could. I think the most important job of a police chief at this time is to be visible, present, and there for the community members that need the help. And also for the students. The students have to feel safe in their environment and the employees have to feel safe going back to work. And as many resources as I can provide to help that happen, I would. Also, we can provide chaplaincy, we can provide our peer support officers, we can provide emotional wellness for anybody that needs it, and we can be there in any way that we can be. On the other side of that, there's a security concern now at our schools that we have to work with. And we have to know, we have to help identify what those security concerns are and make sure that we have the resources available and in place to keep everybody safe. Just because that student was on campus doesn't make it any less of my priority as police chief. They could have been walking up to the school, they could have been on their way home from school, and that danger still exists. So we have to work in partnership to keep all of our students safe. And on the other side of that, to be aware of what's going on with the people who could be a danger to our students and to our community and using the data-driven technologies that we have and make sure that we're conducting enforcement where needed and when needed. Thank you. Mr. Sager. That tragic death hit a number of people I know very closely. I have two sons that go to high school here in Stockton. And they had friends at that high school. And their friends are hurting. I've worked with the members of the SUSD Police Department for years. Some of them work with Stockton. They were one of the first responders when um, Officer Jimmy Ann was killed. And they came to help us, and we went to help them yesterday. I know that they've reached out to, to ask for some help, some peer support, because our officers are hurting too. As the chief of police, my role is to work at the high level with Chief Berries, not only Chief Berries, but the other law enforcement agencies in Stockton, on how we can provide a feeling of security on campus. What can we do? What, uh, what extra patrols can we do? What extra resources can we provide? What training can we give to the school CSMs? What, what training can we do with the, the school administration? But then also looking at preventing crime through the environmental designs of the schools. Many of Stockton schools were built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They have, they're not built like the newer high schools that are harder to get into, harder to access, where you have to go through gates, uh, the, some of these schools were built in a very open neighborhood format because when they were built, that's how schools were built. So how do we work with our specialty and with our crime prevention and looking at the environmental design and provide that as a, as, a, as a help to them as well? And as the chief has said, you have to be out there in front. This is still our community. It's still in the city of Stockton. So while it's not necessarily our jurisdiction, it is our responsibility to be there to help whether it be through an MOU that we already have with SUSDPD or just because they're an allied agency and those kids live in our community and we need to be there to help them. Thank you. Mr. McPadden. Yeah, so absolutely, you know, that's a terrible tragedy. 
and a, a very strong partnership I would have would be with the school district and the school district the police district. It, 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 it's crucial that you have that partnership. We all want our kids to be safe. As I said, the kids don't start on campus. They have to make their way to campus. And it, it's very concerning. It, it's hard for our children in these high crime areas to get to school safely. You know, some of them, they get hit up on the way to school. They get sexually harassed. They get, they get pressured. They get bullied. We have to create those safe passageways to and from school. And that's where we got to empower the community. That's where we have to work with the school district officers. We have to work with Stockton police officers. We have to work with the community to, to where we can have these safe passages. Some folks call it, it it's a walking bus. You know, where the parents would join forces and all the kids would gather that don't have school bus services or something else that would get them to school safely. The, the, the parents team together and, and they walk the children to school. Then after school, they team up and, and they walk the children home. It's a lot of pressures for the children. It, it, it's gonna continue. They can't escape it. You know, when we were young, when the school was over and it was summertime, you know, the bullying stopped. But now that it's all on digital now. There, there is no escape for our children. So we need to um, be there for each other. We need to have open conversations, consistent conversations, and just be intentional in ensuring that we keep our children safe on campus. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Just a horrific incident, and we're having too many horrific incidents. In our country, every week, we had two active shooters over the weekend. One was in the state of Pennsylvania in the western part of the state. There's obviously going to be a criminal investigation. There's been an apprehension. But I think when we have these types of critical incidents, we need to go a step further. We have to look to do some type of what's called a sentinel review, similar to what's done when there's, when there's an aviation accident or there's an unexplained death in the medical community. We need to look beyond the initial criminal investigation, look at this perpetrator and find out, look at that person's entire life history. Was there something different? Was there some point at which someone could have intervened? Is, is this a criminal incident? Of course it is, but is there, is there also a mental health issue that goes alongside of it? To look, to, when you have a tragedy like this, the only thing that you can hope for, besides a successful prosecution, is that you can find a way or find some piece of information that you can utilize in the future to prevent something from, like this from happening again. And of course, it's critically important that the Stockton police and the entire Stockton community work with the school district, make sure that we bring support, emotional support for the students, for the teachers and other school employees, whether we need to establish safe routes for even temporarily or permanently, and look at the school resource officer program you know, a lot of those programs were pulled back uh, after the murder of George Floyd, and many cities are now restoring them, but may, doing it in a different way, in a different model. It's something to look at, but most of all, we need to look at this incident and see what actually brought us to this point, what caused that to happen, and even look at ourselves at the department and find out whether there's were there previous confrontations between these two individuals or their families? And did the Stockton Police Department uh, take all the appropriate action at that time? It's something I always did with domestic homicides. Thank you. Okay, so the next question comes from the community. Uh, what, would you, what would your approach be to optimizing transparency as it relates to police-involved shootings? To optimize transparency in police-involved shootings, I believe it's a multi-pronged approach. One, the first step is that information that goes out immediately afterwards, making sure that we have accurate and clear information that we have the most knowledge of uh, as soon as we possibly can get that information out to the community in a non-biased way, just a fact pattern of this incident happened. And make sure that we have that information publicly available and is ready immediately after an incident happened. As the stories unfold and as the information becomes greater, providing that information in, again, a non-biased but very factual way of the facts of the case and how it happened. We currently do uh, public release information videos. would continue with that as, as soon as timely possible. Uh, Currently, we are operating within state law, and as we need to release them to ensure that we meet those requirements, but I believe that if that information is available sooner, it should be released when it is available. 
and then providing the full videos as soon as the investigation allows for it in accordance with state law. The other portion of this is that families that are impacted by um, officer critical incidents uh, have trauma also. They've lost a loved one. They are involved in a uh, grieving process. And to ensure that they know the process and understand what they're going to be facing in the future, I believe there needs to be a liaison from the police department to that family that has the information about what to expect, what questions will be asked, and what can happen next in these steps. Because that's a gray area where a lot of people just don't know if you've never been through the process. But these are families that have lost a loved one. And as chief, I will ensure that families that are impacted by officer critical incidents have resources available and the information that they need for closure. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sager. Yes. Critical incidents and officer critical incidents and deaths in the community are, have to be one of the hardest topics that a police chief has to handle. Remaining transparent and accountable through that is of paramount importance. How would I maintain transparency? Well, the initial information has to be as accurate and as timely as possible, providing that as the face of the department and providing as much as we can without impacting or the affecting the investigation. Stay within those state laws and providing body-worn camera footage or video footage or other case, um, the other case descriptions. That has to be done within the timeline for the legal release, but also with respect to the family who just lost a, lost a loved one. If anybody here has ever lost a loved one, we understand the grieving process, and at times that grieving process does not allow you to be and accept items that are in context or even as truth. Now that's hard in the digital age because out there in, right now, anybody with a cell phone or a keypad can put whatever narrative they want. Unfortunately, law enforcement historically has not been built that way. So we have to learn how to be agile and fast in getting the accurate information out. And as we release it, providing it with context, much like we do with our um, with the releases we do with in our critical incidents. As the chief of police, I believe that having those relationships with the community, continue to build them, continue to build trust after incidents with the community and families will allow us to remain accountable and transparent. And again, transparent doesn't mean you get to see completely through to everything. We have to understand the, the, the human resource and the legal side behind that it means you get to see through those still. It can maybe be opaque, but you're still gonna be able to see what's going on. Thank you. Mr. McFadden. Yes, those incidences are very traumatic, not only for the community, also for the, you know, the police department. You know, we've had tragedies that have been internally within Stockton PD and in the Stockton community. So with that, you have to understand there's trauma involved and, and transparency is always most important and what ha has to happen is you have to be honest, you have to be transparent, and it, it, it needs to be messaged clearly as soon as the information's available. Also what needs to happen in, in those situations is we need to reach out to that community where it happens. You know, that community grieves, and it affects a whole community when, when, when someone's life is taken. You know, our goal is to preserve lives. You know, our goal is for the officer to go home at the end of the night, and for everyone they encounter to go home at the end of the night. But, but when we fall short of that, we have to make it priority to be transparent, to be sympathetic, empathetic, everything. We, we, we have to understand those situations. Also something we, we, we've done before and at times it may be necessary is we brought the family in. You know, we helped them with closure to say, here, here, here's what happened. Here's what happened to your daughter. Here's what happened to your son. And that's a case by case situation, but there are times when that is all the family wanted. They just wanted to see how it played out. And we set up that, that atmosphere, that, that closure, that circle of trust, and to where we provided that to them. With that, we also have to post that information on our website. You know, the law requires within 45 days, it has to be posted. Should it be our goal to get to that 45th day? No, I, I, I don't think so, because it's such a traumatic incident. And, you know, the sooner we can gather the facts and all the information and 
ensure it's, um, it's vetted out as far as its accuracy, that information needs to be available. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Sullivan. That's one thing we've always said in law enforcement. I, my job is to make sure I get home at night. One of the things that we have to change is in law enforcement is what we need to say is we all need to go home at night, the police and the community. But unfortunately, when we have an incident where an officer utilizes deadly force, I think you have, you correctly have an expectation to see your police chief or deputy chief on scene, making sure that they gather as much information as possible and they are very clear about what they know, very clear about what they don't know, and very clear about what they will find out. And when, when that is done correctly, it engenders trust. Now there's the issue of body-worn camera footage. It's, it's critically important that we get that body-worn camera footage out for the public to see. That being said, it's also very important that before we do that, we, we do talk to the family of the person that has lost their life, that we give them the opportunity to look at the video. We find out what their feelings are about release of the video. The other thing is that we have to work in concert with the district attorney. If, if an officer has broken the law, we wanna, I want to make sure as the chief that I don't do anything that hampers that investigation and, and subsequent prosecution. But I will be very careful and very clear about communicating to the community why I'm delaying the release of that, that body-worn camera video so that I do not hamper that. Um, and of course, it, and as, as the deputy chief said, it's, it's critically important that you have a liaison assigned to the, va the family, someone who is skilled in, in victim assistance because and they are victims. Um, even, even if their loved one has done something wrong, um, the, they've suffered a traumatic loss and we need to respond as a police department to them as we would to any other citizen that has suffered a similar tragic loss. Thank you. The next question is by council member Susan Lenz, and she offers some background, so I'll read the background. In 2013, Stockton voters approved measure A and B, which increased sales tax three quarters of a percent to Stockton residents. One of the items promised to the voters was to the, additional, the addition of 120 sworn officers in the following three years. After the passing of Measure A, unfortunately, this has not happened even though efforts have been made by the city. And the question reads as follows. As, your police, as our police chief, what efforts would you recommend to increase our PD staffing to the level that was promised to the voters of our city to ensure that we have the PD officers necessary in Stockton for public safety? Absolutely. Uh, when Measure A and B passed, we understood that that was going to be really challenging to get that number of officers, but we were going to do it. And we were well on our way to that number, and we had succeeded in a lot of our goals. And we didn't quite reach it, but had no, um, no slowdown from our organization in the hiring. I currently oversee the recruitment and retention and the hiring of officers. And uh, one of the things that we're finding to be critical is that the applicant pool is not what it was before. And that makes it very challenging. It doesn't make it so that we stop. It just means that it's challenging. So we have to be innovative and creative and figure out how we're going to get more officers. Uh, I always say that I cannot recruit enough officers for the police department. I would love to, but there is no way that I personally can do this. It requires my entire community to bring officers in, to bring people in who are going to be officers at the Stockton Police Department. The more help I have for my community, the better I'm going to be at my staffing levels. To do that, though, I need the community to trust the organization and want their family members to come work for us. That's my number one goal, is trying to make sure that we have enough community trust that if somebody says, my son wants to come, for the stock, come work for the Stockton Police Department and I wholeheartedly want them to, that you send them my way so we can hire them. That is exactly what we want. A secondary piece to that is the retention piece. 
And for retention, it's morale. It's figuring out how to make officers want to stay at our organization. Uh, a couple of my goals that lead to that are figuring out how we're going to streamline the work that we do using the data that we collect and where can we save time and space. So these officers aren't working quite as hard. They're still very, very busy as expected, but they have a better sense of morale. Having trust in your leadership. I am a trusted leader in this organization. Having trust in me, having trust in the community is going to to help the officers want to stay here. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sager. It's been offered that the community are the police and the police are the community. The only difference is the police are the ones that are, get paid to do it 24-7. Being from the community, I see a gap where we could step up. That, regard, that requires trust from the community. When a community asks that their police department resemble the community, then the community must step forward. And it's not just find that young person who says they want to be a police officer. Those of us who are on the stage, we know this is a calling, this is a vocation for us. It, we do it for different reasons. Personally, I do it because I want to help people. So my life's mission is to help people as much as I can on a one-to-one -one basis, and if I could help spread that down and pay it forward, then I do. Looking for people in the community that want to help other people, that want to follow the motto on the card to make a difference to find young people who care about their community and how it does as much as they care about the people inside their home. So as we build that trust in the community, I can only take our, our 20 plus recruiters and only recruit so much, but I could use all 320,000 people in the city of Stockton and your relatives all over the West Coast in America to say, if you are a good person, you want to work and you want to be a police officer, you want to help people, you want to work in public safety, Stockton's a place for you to go and that's the place to be. When it comes to measure, I understand that 120 number was very hard to reach. We knew that. We've hired three times that many officers and still trying to meet, meet that level. I believe through impacting morale and providing the the best opportunity for people to become law enforcement in Stockton, we will reach that number one day. Thank you. Mr. McFadden. Yes, recruiting and retention is a challenge for um, all agencies, but it, it, I think it's a meetable challenge. You know, for example, in San Jose, when I was over hiring recruiting, we were pulling in 150 officers running three academies a year of 50. Now we dropped down to three academies a year of 30 to 40. So the personnel is out there, the interest is out there, but you have to be tenacious. You have to have a robust website that really focuses on your needs and your wants, and it's gotta look nice and colorful so the youngsters like it and they wanna click on it. You know, you have to be everywhere. You know, we go a lot of uh, college institutions, we go to a lot of um, uh, military bases. And at, at the end of the day, the best recruiter is your line staff. And if your line staff's morale is low, they're not gonna recruit more officers to come to their department. So you have to build up the morale, you have to get the officers feeling good about where they work, and, and they won't have 411 recruiters. You know, I know the authorized staffing is 485, they're at 411. Most cities have the challenge of getting the authorized staffing. You know, to have that authorized staffing there, that's incredible. Now it's just people towing the line and being intentional and, and, and just making it work. You know, you have to get out there in those communities that are underserved. You, you, have, to get, you have to diversify your police department. It, it's hard to recruit different individuals if they don't see that on the force, if they don't see it on, uh, on, in the yearbook of photos, you know, it's not something they feel they can be a part of. But if we get the agency diversified, if we get them to the areas they need to be, we could build this department up, and I, I, I truly believe we can meet those numbers. Thank you. And Mr. Sullivan. First, I want to begin with retention. We need to do internal surveys to find out why exactly what we're leaving officers and what would make officers agree to stay. That way, that, that way the success we have in recruitment will actually add up to an increase in overall staffing. When I look at, I also want to do a similar data, data dive to find out what, it, what is it that it, is not causing people to want to be a member of the Stockton Police Department. Obviously, Stockton's not unusual, not like most other police departments that are facing a similar challenge. And what is it we can do to make the Stockton Police Department more attractive to potential candidates, people that do want to go into law enforcement, 
and Wiley leaving shortly after graduating the, from the police academy to go to other departments. I think one of the things is that if you do that, you need to repay us for the, the money that we, we invested in your education in the police academy. Um, but beyond that, when we talk about the local universities, we need to be innovative. We need to get in, we, we need to reach out to the criminal justice department. And not just that, IT, uh, other, other talents we need in the department. And it's, it's not about just going to career days. It's about getting in those classrooms and speaking to students, taking questions. It's also about the way we market ourselves. Young people today, they, if they're interested in being police officers, it's because they want to engage with the community. They want to be problem solvers. They want those type of challenges. They're not looking to be uh, at, at, at what used to be uh, considered to be attractive about policing. And we have to make sure that our marketing strategy is, is focused on that. And I think we also have to be part of the conversation of what are the requirements to be a police officer in the state of California, as well as the Stockton Police Department. How, when was the last time we really looked at those and to see if they're really cur current and they're job related? As the chief of training in Philadelphia, I made changes in the way that we've recruited. I made changes in the order in which we applied the test. Thank you. A <laughs> um, couple of more questions and we'll be done. So this question comes from council member Kimberly Wormsley. And this is the background that she offered. Trust is one of the critical aspects between the community and law enforcement. This community has done so much in pertaining to opening the line of communication and building trust collectively. As chief of police, what is your, your vision to continue to carry the torch in bridge bridging the gap and ensuring trust and transparency between law enforcement and community members? Thank you. I believe in uh, a, it's a five-part program for this, and it really is. Uh, it's uh, Play-Doh. Sometimes I can only remember stuff with acronyms. It's the way my brain works. Sorry. Uh, but we start with policy. We start with making sure that our policies reflect the community and that the community agrees with those policies. All of our policies are posted online. They're available. And we collaborate with the community advisory board when new policies come to fruition. And then we have uh, leadership. The strong leader is going to step up and say, this is how we're going to lead according to these policies. These are my expectations. This is how I'm going to guide you to meet those expectations. And this is how we are going to police our communities. And this is how our communities are going to come back and police us. And these are the expectations. I expect my community members to come forward when they see a violation of policy or a transgression for my officers. And that leads me to my A, which is accountability. It is my job as chief to hold our employees accountable accountable for their actions and to ensure that they are operating in accordance with the law in accordance with the policies that are in existence. And then you move on to the transparency. When things happen, the community has a right to know what the police are doing, what their interactions look like, and how we can better those interactions. And that's where it is very apparent that we need more transparency for that the community, so that the community feels that they're getting all of the information that they need. And then the last part of that becomes the oversight. And the oversight is what you all do today. It's what you do every single day. It's what our electeds do at council when they bring up issues and they say, this is a problem and this is how we need it addressed. These, those, that's the oversight piece. We have the city manager's review board. We have the community advisory board and many other places where we can utilize that odor, oversight. So going with that five-part approach ensures that we're going to continue to have transparency in our community, open the lines of trust and communication, and once we do those things successfully while engaging with our community all the time, we're going to have that ongoing relationship that we need to be successful, both of us, both the community and the police. Thank you, Ms. Nance. Mr. Could you, Sager. Could you please repeat once? I want to make sure I got it all. As Chief of Police, what is your vision to continue to carry the torch in bridging the gap in ensuring trust and transparency between our law enforcement and community members? I'd like to bridge the gap in, with the community by also providing a succession plan for the department for 15 to 20 years. As I said earlier, earlier in my career, I was allowed to work in communities and work in partnership with community groups, community members, some who I see here today. I've had the opportunity throughout my career to keep that going. That's helped make me the candidate I am today and the officer I am today. And over time, as the deputy chief mentioned, we've siloed that off. My vision of the future starts with accessibility. 
our line officers, our sergeants on the street that work day shift, swing shift, graveyard shift, the detectives, our professional staff, have to have access to the community, whether through community meetings within the department or outside. That accessibility gets you in the room. You can see each other. You're no longer an email. You're no longer a phone number on the Cisco phone. You're not, you're not faceless. You now have a face. And in that, we see the community. The community can see that we're human, too. We're part of that community. By having that accessibility, we start to communicate. That communication and through interaction, we build that trust. And when that trust comes, then we look at how, tra how, transparency, how transparent we are and how we share our information, because the information sharing goes both ways. And with transparency, because the community can see what happened in the department, the department sees what happened in the community, we can hold each other accountable when we say something's going to happen or we're going to do something or in our partnerships. And then we repeat that with the next officer and the next officer so that 24 years from now, the officer that just hit the streets today in the training program can be up on the stage saying how they want to be the next chief of police. Thank you. Mr. McFadden. Yeah, so, so bridging that gap, we have to start with, of course, trust and legitimacy. We're, we're having those honest, honest conversations in the neighborhoods, and, and we're getting the feedback. And not only are we receiving that feedback, we have to be correcting our behaviors based off of feedback. Okay, if we empower the community and they feel valued and they feel part of something, it's contagious. It'll bring more community members. You know, yes, I, I believe Coffee with a Cop is successful, but I, I think it's more important to deal with each community as it is fit. Coffee with a Cop will not get everyone in every community at that table. Sometimes you have to bring the table and, and meet people where they are. So with that, you, you, you have to get to those areas where you know, communities are marginalized. You know, also policy and oversight is you have to be an open book. You know, all policies are posted on, on internet websites. I like think it sounds they were a very robust website, which I, I think is something would be good to mirror here. Is at any time any community member can, they can go on our website and see where we used force last. They can see what type of arrest, what were the demographics of who we arrested. We're very open and, and transparent with the resources that we have, and we continue to expand on what we could do with data. With that, it, it's important that we take ownership when things are brought to our attention. If I'm at a community event and something happens and it, it gets back to me, it's, it's not helping me when things are still happening. If I'm having a conversation about trust building, the great efforts we're doing, how we're joining forces, and, and an officer is doing something deemed inappropriate in another part of Stockton, it sets us back. So it's got to be, it's got to work from the ground up. That not only sworn personnel, but all professional staff of everyone has to buy into that. And by us being transparent and, and following policy and practices and accepting that feedback and owning that feedback from the community, it, it's going to bridge those gaps. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan. Uh, trust begins with transparency. Anyone in the city of Stockton, anyone should be able to go on to the police department, Stockton Police Department's website, and you should be able to see uh, critical data in, in a dashboard format of how do, how do we utilize force? Uh, are we, uh, do we hold our officers accountable? What, how, what, what, what is the sustain rate of complaints? How often do we impose discipline? And, and what is that discipline? It also involves collaboration. We talked about that before. The citizens of Stockton have a right to have an active role in making important decisions involving policing because these are the decisions that affect them and their family and their everyday lives. And of course, input and collaboration in how we address things like violent crime. I wanna make sure that when we're addressing violent crime, we're being very, very focused, laser-like focus, and we're being very data-driven. So we're looking at the, ca the causation of crime and, and looking at those factors that the community can impact themselves or other city agents, agencies beyond the police can impact before we go in and do enforcement actions and, in, and, and we make sure that those enforcement actions are not done in an indiscriminate fashion. But when we do have to go in and we have to serve warrants or take other type of aggressive law enforcement action, that we're right there explaining to the community so shortly thereafter what just transpired, transpired and why it transpired 
that it was a result of community complaints that we were listening to, to, to what, what they were saying to us and we were taking action based upon, a, upon that. I think uh, you put all those things together and that's how you continue to grow trust um, with, with the citizens of Stockton. Thank you. Last but not least, community question. Okay, so what is your approach to addressing a significant increase in moving violations, such as speeding and failure to stop at red lights? And it's a two-part question. How would you ensure that racial bias does not play a part in the number and the type of traffic stops? I can do this mostly is through the intelligence-led policing model, and it's actually something that I started when I was uh, the captain overseeing the traffic unit, and ensuring that the areas where the traffic officers were conducting the, their most enforcement was the same areas where collisions were concerned were happening, and also for the violations that were occurring in those neighborhoods. I don't care how many tickets are written a day for what, as long as they are written in a very just and fair manner in the area where the accidents are occurring. It is the primary focus to make sure that we are stopping and preventing collisions and making our community safe in their traffic vision, in their traffic journeys. This is something that's very near and dear to my heart. Many of you know this personally about me, but I wanna make sure that every intersection in this community is safe for every person to enter. To do that, we have to look at the information. We have to look at the data. Where do my collisions occur? Where do the, where do the accident and injury collisions occur? And where are those, and what are the violations that are causing those collisions? To ensure that we're not being biased, we are working on that with both training and ensuring that the officers are appropriately trained on recognizing their biases, to recognizing why they're making stops, and to ensure that they have the proper probable cause for these stops by focusing on the moving violations, not the low-level offenses that uh, sometimes will get us stats or data that we want and bring in tickets. That's not the goal. The goal is to make our community safer and making sure our enforcement is specific to the areas we're needing it. That doesn't just go for traffic though, that should go for every crime that we're investigating in every area that we're policing. We should be looking at where the crimes are occurring, when they're occurring, and by who they're occurring. And those are the people that we should be targeting in that enforcement to ensure that we are being fair and just in our policing. Thank you. Traffic enforcement is, is important to the safety of the community. It impacts children walking to school. It impacts people just walking to the store. How we enforce that has to be just. It has to be unbiased. And that starts with the training. That starts with the procedural just and implicit bias training we give our officers and making sure that all of our officers, not just our traffic unit who does the majority of the traffic stops, that all of our officers understand what it might feel like by a community member getting, being stopped and feel they were stopped for the color of their skin or for the neighborhood they live in. Then it goes to supervision, making sure that our sergeants and our, our managers understand it's their duty to oversee and supervise their people. So does that mean when someone calls a complaint, understanding how their officers are interacting with the public? I had one officer as a young sergeant who had a number of complaints, and none of them none of them ever went to the point of a full complaint, but the people said he just he didn't sound nice to me. So I've worked, with that, I've worked with that officer and, hey, tell me how you talk to people. And I realized, yeah, you know, you almost come across condescending. How about you try this? So being a supervisor and, and working with our people. And then you look at the data. How are we stopping people? For what reasons and where? And then you combine that and you marry that to the officer themselves and you look to see if there's any patterns. If the officer is part of any early warning system for complaints, if the officer has had other issues, and how do we retrain that out of them? So by training and supervision and looking at data, not just at traffic stops, but in every enforcement we do, that'll help bring that accountability to the department, provide transparency to the community, and help build that trust. Thank you. Mr. McFadden. Yes, when it comes to traffic safety, uh, fatalities, or injury accidents, it's, it's important that you collaborate with you know, city engineers, with uh, the uh, Department of Transportation, and, and just take a collaborative effort for it. Sometimes you need that you need a roundabout there or, or you need speed bumps put in. It varies from intersection to intersection. 
With that, it, it, it's important that you start with education and visibility. Sometimes just having motorcycles out there will uh, correct the behavior. It, you don't always have to cite someone to correct the behavior. So first and foremost, to be educating the community about what's going on in the area, you even put out bulletins, use social media, say, hey, we're concerned about traffic accidents in this area. How can we collaborate together as a team, involve the community in those areas as well? Th then it becomes a co-public safety event where it, it's not only the traffic unit uh, targeting that area, but we also have the community empowered and understanding the importance of traffic safety. If it doesn't work with the visibility and education, and educating individuals, then of, of course you have to escalate that to citations. And again, th there should always be a conversation as a why. A lot of times when people get upset, it's because they don't get the why. So it's very important to have those conversations up front, be honest, be transparent, even post the locations. It doesn't need to be a secret. Even we're getting out that, hey, there's gonna be some fixed motorcycles on this intersection, it's gonna help us with, with, with calming the traffic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Sullivan? It's, very, it's critical that we be data-driven with traffic enforcement, DUI checkpoints, things of that nature, so we can demonstrate that we are where we are for, for statistics that, that we can stand up. That being said, it's critically important that we track what our officers are doing, that, our, that I ensure that the sergeants and lieutenants are doing that at the line level. They're reviewing reports that demonstrate that the officers were making valid car stops, that they were being procedural just in the way, the way that they were conducting them, and they were being consistent. And I would always send a message that we're not about generating revenue. We're a police department. We're about saving lives. Uh, to, to generating tickets is, is, not the, is not the goal. That's not why we're out there. Um, but I think it's, it's critically important that if we're going to do an operation, that we, 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 we make it very clear to the public in advance that we will be in a certain area, why we're going to be in that area, and that we will be doing traffic enforcement and do everything we can to prevent them from c committing transgressions so there isn't a need for a car stop. Um, there's also looking at technology to see what we could do to do traffic enforcement, um, such as speed cameras and red light cameras, to minimize the interactions between the, the police and, and members of the community. The, the other topic, and, and we, 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 there was a recently a, a regulation passed in Philadelphia that prevented officers from making stops for a variety of reasons. And to be honest with you, and uh, when I was interviewed by the media about that, I objected to it because I think as, the, as police, I, I like the idea of helping people be legal, not encouraging them to be illegal. Meaning that, yes, people need their, need their vehicles to get to work, and a lot of people don't have means. And if they're having a problem complying with the motor vehicle code, let's utilize uh, some of the rescue money or other funds to help them get into compliance and, and so that they're driving safe vehicles, which will be another way of reducing traffic fatalities and traffic injuries, which are up. Thank you. Well, on behalf of our city council, our city staff, Thank you so much for your commitment. Thank you so much for stepping up to the plate and being willing to address our local community. To our local community, thank you so much for being here. It really demonstrates your, your caring, your willingness to, to look forward and, and see who's going to be the next leader. So, and to manager Harry Black.